Thank you, Emma. My name is Ian, and I also would like to say welcome to this Sunday. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, it's been great to be part of the Easter celebrations over the last few days with uh, Hope Church. I took the theme, A Lot Can Happen in Three Days. I shared that on Friday for all sorts of reasons, just because I'm weird enough to like that sort of thinking. A lot can happen in three days. I explained that on Friday. But I think as I look at uh, life and think about a whole range of things, I think over the last few years, it's been a sort of a strange normal, I would say, that has been around our world, pre-COVID, post-COVID. And maybe, though, if you've been part of Hope Church for a while, maybe the the word strange normal is what you've become used to uh, in your journey over the last few years. Every year is a different year compared to the year before. You know that if you're here. Uh, Strange normal, you know, there's some things we think are normal, some things that are strange. I think the key moment in my life in the last few years when I realised things were sort of not as they should be was that picture, you know, the desire to have toilet paper, the empty shelf scenario. Many of you would remember that. You walk in and think, there's no toilet paper here. There's no tissues. There's no paper towels. It was one of those moments in time I'd never experienced that before. I certainly felt that too as an older man when I had to queue up for Woolworths at 6 a.m. in the morning because old people could go early in the morning to get the toilet paper. And you're in a queue to just buy toilet paper. It's like, this is a weird day and a weird few years. I also felt that a few years ago, a Good Friday. Uh, I used to go to 7-Eleven. I'm formally retired now. Uh, on a Good Friday, I'd get my normal coffee, because they were cheap, uh, and get a newspaper. And the lady behind the counter said, excuse me, sir, would you like to buy some toilet paper? And they were just below the cigarettes. And it felt like, this is contraband. You should speak softly. If I buy two packets, can I walk them out of the car and no one can see? It was weird. Surely you too have felt that strange kind of normal. What is normal? That great theologian, Morticia Adams, uh, says this. Normal is an illusion. What is normal for the spider is chaos for the fly. In the Australian vernacular, ain't that the truth? And if you think about what young Emma has just read out to us, you can think about that whole issue of chaos, even if you get to uh, verse 64. Therefore, give orders that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise... The disciples may come, steal him, and tell the people he has been raised from the dead. Then the last deception will be worse than the first. Chaos would reign. Now, I don't know why you're here today. This is a rhetorical question, so don't respond. Maybe you've been dragged here. Maybe your parents said you don't get Sunday lunch if you don't turn up to church. Maybe your sister or brother or mum and dad said, come along. Come and see what we believe to be true based on the eyewitness accounts of others. That's why we gather and celebrate. That's why you could see young Bev in the middle, full of joy, singing about the risen Christ. But maybe sometimes, too, we can just say, well, he's risen, and not feel the weight of those words. The weight of those words. Because don't forget, uh, when Jesus was risen from the grave, he actually revealed himself to women first. Very significant. And even if you read other accounts, there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In Luke's account, in Luke 24... Uh, as the women came back to tell the men, men sometimes are hard to hear, unlike the men in this church. And what did Peter say uh, as he thought, Luke 24? But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. So if you're here today thinking, it's still pretty confusing, you're not alone. Those back then who'd heard about this thing called the tomb was empty... They too believe well, it's, just, it's nonsense. How, how can that be true? So let me pray. Heavenly Father, guide us this morning. Speak directly to those who need to hear the good news of Christ. God, my thoughts, Father, and open our ears and our eyes to see you as who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, what is normal? Uh, hard to believe sometimes. Uh, normal probably means average, same as yesterday, no change, just things you come to expect. Uh, most of us, maybe we think, well, we have made advances in technology, advances in building, science, philosophy, all those things. I don't think we've made too many advances in relationships and other things, sexual etiquette, all that sort of stuff. Yet we realise, if we look back at the last few years, if anything we've been taught, it's that life is fragile. I hope you realise that. Your life is fragile. We don't have guarantees about what tomorrow will bring. 
We don't control yesterday's. We certainly don't control today's. And we don't control the tomorrow's. We are truly, as humans, vulnerable. We don't, can't answer the bigger questions in life. Even in 2023, all these years later, we still struggle to find answers. We know what life is like to be disrupted. We know what life is like when what, the supply chains are broken and you don't, don't get the things that you should. Uh, a few years ago, a doctor in Spain, as he was being traumatised by the death that Spain was experiencing, he made this comment, we have sinned from too much confidence. We have sinned from too much confidence. And we as humans can be pretty confident about lots of things. We can think we're pretty strong, pretty good, we've got to act together. We know what's going on. I don't know that's true. Uh, the Bible speaks directly about our fear of death and concern for death. And so when you think of this day, Easter Sunday 2023, and as we think about the human condition and what the resurrection of Christ means, you have to deal with it. Uh, Smitha and Neetha, who were with the interview, they spoke earlier about this thing called the Bible. It's a scary book in one sense. It also might depend on your response to what you read. They had a very particular response, as in, I believe it to be true. Uh, the great Christian writer C.S. Lewis, when he considers uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus, he uses the phrase, it's like it's God's megaphone to the world to say, wake up. Wake up about what is happening to awaken a deaf world. Um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is profoundly re re relevant. Uh, the writer Watchman Nee says this, our old history ends with the cross Friday and our new history begins with the resurrection. That is so significant. So let me uh, ask you the question, what is normal about death? It's a very strange thing to say, you know, because we know the consequence of death. Uh, it, it firstly acknowledges that we don't live forever, in case you're wondering, and that might be bad news to you, but we don't live forever. I know you might like to, but we don't. The, the, the stats are pretty true. One in one passes away. Uh, and you don't hear around the Australian dinner table, and probably your dinner table at lunchtime, you don't hear the conversation, so what do you think what happens to you when you die? It's probably a bit of a downer, you know, Easter, you know, that's not sort of what you talk about. You talk about other things, movies you've seen, music you've listened to, activities you've been to. Uh, because when it comes to death, there's one thing we know. People don't rise from the grave. They don't. You know that. I know that. I've been a pastor for over 30 years, and I've stood alongside men and women, and I know the reality of what happens. When you die, you die. And understand, for the women going to the tomb on that day, as recorded and read out by Emma, and as you see in, in Luke's Gospel and John's Gospel, the women were going to the tomb with what was called spices. They were going to embalm the body. They weren't going to somehow you know, clean up the body or expect to be, to be empty. No, they knew what normal was when it came to death. You stay dead. So don't somehow think, well, the women went along knowing what was going to happen. No, there's no evidence whatsoever about that at all. The Bible is very specific about that. I know what it's like personally, as many of you would, to know what the pain of death is like. Friday died, Saturday must have been a weird first Saturday. And I've experienced that as I have done many funerals. I remember when my father's twin brother died, I was still in high school, and my uh, brother came out as I was walking home from school. He said, don't go inside, Dad's pretty upset. Uh, and as a twin, I think you know there's a greater weight in one sense when you lose your twin. I remember as a pastor, uh, one of the worst experiences I had as a pastor was walking alongside a dad who had to carry his one-year-old baby in the white coffin as he walked to the graveside. And I just think, if only I had magic power to, to change this. It's not right. I know when I had to conduct the funeral service for my brother's young wife, she was only 42 a few years ago, and she passed away with cancer. It's like, oh, the pain of loss is real. You know that, and I know that. It's not as if somehow we have to make it up. Yet on that first Easter Sunday, something profound happened. You know, the tomb, and we captured as Marty did this morning with all sorts, but the tomb was empty. 
you know, we read, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. They came to the place where Jesus was laid, remembering what had happened. They, you know, they might have even rejoiced in the sense that at least he's no longer in pain. I know that when people with cancer pass away, you think, well, at least they're not still suffering. Um, and I'm, you know, as I've already confessed that I'm slightly weird. You know I like music, in case you don't know I like music. Um, and I often wonder, when you go to things, we listen to music. Well, most normal people listen to music, maybe... Those who don't like music don't listen to music. What were Mary, what were they singing or thinking about? And there's a really old song by someone called Engelbert. You can fill in the surname. Um, it's all over now, nothing left to say, just my tears as the orchestra plays. I'm thinking as they're walking, they know it's, it's all over. Like this is Sunday, this is, it's done. There's nothing to see here. And yet, and yet... Something profound has happened. And just a reminder, they go together. Note they go together. In times of heartache and brokenness, it's crucial that you have someone around you. One of the great sadnesses, I think, is uh, through the COVID years when people were passing away on their own. I just can't imagine anything worse than that. Uh, expectations. Understand the expectations that finally... As you understand what was happening when Jesus came, finally the greatest king of all kings, he is a, he's our king. The greatest prophet of all prophets, he's here. And he's on the cross and crucified. It's like, what? And we read this uh, that was read out. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. And don't jump over the weird bits either. Uh, rolled back the stone and sat on it. How strange would that have been to see some angels sitting on a round? It's a round. How can they sit on the round thing anyhow? And they're sitting on it? What? Have you experienced that? I haven't. Don't underestimate the supernatural reality of what is happening in that moment, let alone the supernatural reality of what it takes for God to raise his son. It's not as if we just skip over these words. And the guards were so afraid because they knew what was going on. They knew what had been said. This is not a normal scene. Not a normal scene. Uh, yeah, and yet, how do we capture this? Well, we read. There was, he's not here. He's not here for he's risen. Those three words. He is risen. And he said, come see the place the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. I mean, can you imagine what was going through their mind back then? What is normal about death is that we all experience it. What is not normal about this death is that Christ was risen. He was alive. That, that great phrase, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. You know, I know you're looking for Jesus. And in Luke 24, it says, but he's not here. That great reality. So not normal. So, you know, this is the great for those who uh, know their Bible. The whole John 1 scene. There's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world as they point to Jesus. Here's the one you need to look to. This lamb who's now been sacrificed. This lamb who actually all things have been paid. The price has been paid. Everything Jesus brought came to us on that first Easter. Sins paid, forgiveness given. And now something has been unleashed. And I think Bev captured it at the start of the service. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? It's an amazing thing. And it, in a very real sense, those three days back then have changed the world. The resurrection of Christ is a line in the sand. You have to somehow consider what that means for you, your children, your parents, your family. But in particular, you have to work out for yourself what is your response, regardless if the world says, well, you're mad. Death has been swallowed up in victory. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, a great part of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, for what I received, I passed on to you as the first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. 
that he was buried and he was raised on the third day, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul goes on to say, of course, he appeared to hundreds and hundreds of people. People bear testimony to that. And you have to work out whether you believe the testimony. Imagine if I said to you, there used to be a famous band called The Beatles. It was made up of uh, seven members. It had two women and three drummers. And you'd all sit there quietly saying, wow, that's, that's a lot of baloney, isn't it? It must be. Because we know they only had four members. And what else do we know? There's only two alive. And how do we know that? Because we have a lived experience of that. We can testify to that. We know that to be true. So why would I deny those who also were eyewitnesses to that testimony of the resurrected Christ? You know, it's true. I, I think of the old hymn, and can it be? You know, how should I gain an interest in my Saviour's blood? Died he for me? It, it, wow. So what about Jesus' death? Again, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul says, well, if Christ didn't die, our faith, your faith, is a waste of time. Not only that, Paul goes on further in 1 Corinthians 15 and says, we are to be, it's a terrible word, pitied amongst all men. If Christ hasn't risen, let's all go to the Easter show now. That's too expensive, no. Go home and stream a TV show. If Christ hasn't been risen, you know, for the last 40 years, my world, my life, has been shaped around Sundays. Sunday to Sunday, that's my world. Get up Monday, what's happening? What's happening on Sunday? You mean I could have done other things on those weekends if Christ hadn't risen? But he did. He did. It changed everything. And why is three days significant? Well, the resurrection after three days proves to Jesus' opponents that he truly was dead and that he truly rose physically. According to the Jewish tra tradition, a person's soul or spirit remained with their body for three days. After three days, it departed the body. Three days of significance. Uh, what's another reason? Another reason, of course, is, well, what did Jesus say? Matthew 16, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. Suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day, be raised, raised from, uh, to life. I mean, Jesus predicted it. The Old Testament spoke around this. Jesus died on a Friday when the Passover lamb was sacrificed. His death represents a perfect, unblemished sacrifice, so we can live forever. It also helps the unbelieving Jews believe that Jesus died. And again, the three days, as Jesus himself prophesied, God's power is revealed in this moment. God's power is revealed on this third day, this resurrection day. You know, we talk about Friday being good. Sunday is pretty awesome. Sunday is a pretty awesome day. You know, the angel says to the women, don't be afraid. He's risen. Jesus appears directly to the women. Go and tell the men. And I tell you what, if you're going to try to have a story or create a story, you would not reveal yourself to the women. You just wouldn't. Not historically. Why? Because men back then didn't believe the women, unlike today. Move on, Ian. I'll move on. Um, you know, the whole idea that you reveal yourself to those who no one listens to doesn't make sense. And again, it actually brings a verification to the truth of this. It's this historical event. It's rational. The Bible makes sense of all that we live and how we live in this world that is full of empty. I still find that clip that Cameron arranged to show. The reality, the emptiness is true. As you get older, unlike many of you here, you start to have to grapple with the emptiness of what does it mean when you retire? What, does, what do you fill your life with? If you lose a loved one, what do you fill your life with? I watch older people around me, they sort of go to bed early at night. They have dinner really early. They probably have breakfast the night before so they don't have to have it so early the next day. <laughs> Things change and you're trying to make up this thing that filled your life. And hearts get broken for all sorts of reasons. You know, this irreversible truth 
The dead don't rise. And yet, we have to grapple with what happened that first Easter. And I sometimes think, you know, I've, I've heard this story so many times. People say, I wish we could go to life and go back to normal. I've got no idea what normal is. I don't think I've lived a normal life. I do, I do, what, what is this normal life we somehow think? You know, I know you might think some politicians want us to go back to... How far back do we go? <laughs> the 40s? Bad, bad decade. World War II. Let's go back earlier. No, that's worse. Uh, you know, where do we go back to? I don't know. Let's go back to the 80s when interest rates were about 55%. No, no, that's a bad period. Let's, well, where, where, where do we go? Where's normal? No such thing never has been normal. You know, COVID changed that as well. You know, life was changed profoundly. And, and we need, and yet we know in society, in life, in your life, in my life, we need a change. It's only through stubbornness we don't accept that. I need to change. No, I'm fine. You need to change. No, you need to change. No, why? I'm perfect. No, you're not. And we just wrestle, internally wrestle this all the time. You know, we live in a wonderful part of the world up here in downtown Livington, Oran Park, around us. It's, it's a wonderful thing, yet people still probably go from paycheck to paycheck trying to survive, pay the bills. And we all wonder, will there be an 11th interest rate rise, a 12th or 13th? Can the interest rates keep going up? Yes, is the answer. Well, what's this normal we want to go back to? You, you know, we are finite beings who need to know where we're going. We need to wrestle with what Christ has done. I want, if anything, this. I want a new normal. I want a new normal that gives me hope and a direction and a future. I want a new normal that actually shows that I'm valuable, that somewhere in my life someone cares for me. I uh, have in my pocket this nice, crisp $20 note. I'm sure Sinead wants it. No, you can't have it. Um, and it's a, if I do that to it... Screw it up, because you're thinking your life is pretty bad, it's rotten, how could a loving God accept me? Do you know what? This is still what? It's still worth $20. It doesn't matter how broken, sinful, corrupt, whatever you think you are, Christ died for you as you are to bring you into a future and a hope and an eternal life. That's the great Easter message. That's the new normal we can all accept. A new normal where I'm met by Jesus, given a future, given a hope. You know, I'm not surprised that when the women saw him, do you remember the words that Emma read out? They worshipped him. They acknowledged who he was. They worshipped him. Don't miss how astonishing, how inconceivable, how amazing this is. No wonder we sing amazing grace, one Writer said, this Easter is a great day for reaffirming our conviction that Jesus Christ is no mere man, no mere angel, no mere creature, but from everlasting to everlasting, he is God through whom and for all, and for whom all things exist. You know, it's amazing because we need hope. We all need hope. That's why I love the name of this church. And this community needs this church, by the way, in case you're wondering. It needs the hope that you guys have so they can know that same hope. Uh, you know, and, and my hope isn't because somehow I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I have hope because I know as a sinner that Christ died for me. That's why I have hope. And that therefore he rose again for me and for you. Uh, many people might think, well, maybe it's just a story. It doesn't, no, that doesn't make sense. You know, one writer, outside of the cross of Jesus Christ, there is no hope in this world. That cross and resurrection at the core of the gospel is the only hope for humanity. Wherever you go, ask God for wisdom on how to get that gospel in, even in the toughest situations of life. And we often experience tough situations. Easter says God cares for you. God loves you. God died in your place because he died a death that you could not die. His love was not in vain. His love was costly. And now that he has risen, he gives us a hope for the future. The stone has been rolled away. I love the old song that sings about that. The tomb is empty. The witnesses testify that he was not there. You know, sometimes when I think of this about hope, you know, hope, 
it, it, it's birthed and it grows and it gets stronger. I think it gets stronger in me as I get older. Because as I get older, I can see the checkered flag just down there, not far away. I'm not 20. I certainly ain't 40. And as for 60, I vaguely remember it. But I know what waits, and I have no fear about that, because I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going, and I know the place that who's, I know the one who's actually given me a place in heaven. And it's Jesus. I hope that for you. Whatever grave clothes you're wrapped up in right now, whatever stops you breaking free of that and being unleashed into a new day or a new normal or a new person, whatever situation you find yourself in, whatever struggle, your past, your present, your issues, whatever it might be, God loves you, as I said, no matter what. No matter what, except what he has done. Wow, three words. He is risen. He's risen. You know, one of the things that I think I struggle with as I wrap this up, back in the <clears throat> COVID days, we wanted everything to be reopened. Just back to, can we book a ticket? Can we book a seat in a restaurant? And maybe you've got to give me your credit card first before I, you, know, you might not turn up. And can we, you know, can you just open the doors? Can't we just come in? No, you've got to book your seat. You've got to book your ticket. Just reserve a table by the window or something. That was the reality of the life we all lived. Have you reserved your seat in heaven? Have you booked a seat for that eternal destination? Or are you just treading water? Don't do that today. Let Easter 2023, Hope Anglican Church, downtown Leppington, let it be a marker in your spiritual life and your future journey. As you come to say, Jesus, I need you. Three words, four words. Accept the new normal by accepting Christ. Life did not end on the Friday. And the experience of isolation on the Saturday changed with Sunday. Because he rose. Today we know that hope itself is just the beginning of all our journey. Because of what Christ has done. May it be you think about that. On the screen is a small prayer. In a moment Cameron will come up and wrap it up. It just is a way, there's no magic in the words. Uh, I'm not going to get you to stand as much as I'd like you to stand, come down the front, fall on your knees and confess your faith in Christ. As much as I'd like you to do that, because doing something physically is often a helpful thing to understand that. But I don't know you all that well, so I won't do that. I won't get you to raise your hands as much as I'm tempted to. But I'm going to pray this prayer. And if you'd like to come to a point in your life where you say, I need Jesus, then just pray it quietly in your heart and Cameron will help you take the next step for that. So I'm going to ask you all, if you're comfortable, to bow your head. That's what we do. Close your eyes. You can keep them open. It's up to you. But I'm going to read this out slowly. And if you'd like to accept Christ or recommit your life to Christ, then say it with me as I say it out loud. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. That you died on the cross and rose to new life. To rescue me from sin and death. And to restore me to the Father. I choose now to turn from my sins. My self-centeredness and every part of my life that does not please you. I choose you. I choose hope. I give myself to you. Amen. If you've prayed that. Welcome to God's family. <laughs>